You have voiced support for a flat tax system. Uh, are you concerned about the potential increase in inequality resulting from such a system? One of the interesting things is some of the wealthy pay no taxes. Some of the corporations, wealthy corporations, pay no taxes under the current system. Another interesting fact, uh, over the last five years, income inequality has gotten worse, even though we raised tax rates. So it is something you have to kind of think through as far as how you want to make it better. I'm of the opinion that the way you stimulate the economy and the way you create jobs is by leaving more money in the economy. And you may say that sounds incredibly simplistic, but it's true. The private economy creates jobs. We have to have a certain amount of government, but we should minimize the size of government because it's not very good at stuff. Why is, I'll often, I'll often say, I'll often say it's not that government is inherently stupid, although it's a debatable point, <laughs> it's that they don't get the same signals. So for example, we need to have a national defense and it can't be done privately. Same with the judiciary and the legislative branch and roads and education and things like this where the government will be involved. And so I think you can argue that that should occur, but we should keep it and not expand it to all walks of life. Do they, does the government need to sell pizza? You know, does the government need to deliver the mail? That's really a problem. They probably shouldn't be delivering the mail. They're not very good at that either. But um, <laughs> we should minimize what government does and try to maximize the private sector. And that's, I think, where jobs are created. But to me, though, it's getting beyond the hurdle. I can go to a poor community in the mountains of eastern Kentucky and I'll say, bring me the 10 richest people in your town because I would like to reduce their taxes. And you may be horrified and say, oh, he cares only about rich people. No, we all work for rich people. So I want the people who own the business, the guy who owns the business in Middlesbrough, Kentucky, who employs 100 people, is probably the richest guy in town. How am I going to get him to hire, a, or, or her, to hire 110 people? Reduce their taxes. So we got to get over this class warfare that rich people are bad people. The top 1% pay 40% of the income tax. There are some exceptions to the rule, and we should fix the exceptions, meaning that if there's some in the top 1% that aren't paying taxes, they should. In some ways, a flat tax accumulates more of those people and you lose less of those people by having less deductions and having a flatter, simpler code. But I'm also for reducing everyone's taxes, not just the middle class, everyone's taxes. Uh, this is going to be your very last question. Um, we are here at the number one public university in the world. Something we tell ourselves a lot. You're, uh, you're not at all biased, right? Of course not, all right. of course not. Um, this relates to that. Do you believe the federal government should play a role in supporting higher education? Uh, if so, describe. I believe in general that the more local control of education, the better. So you really are not at the Federal University of California at Berkeley, you're at the University, Berkeley at, University of California at Berkeley. You're, you are a state school. And so education has primarily been at the state level. There is some federal influence through Pell Grants and things like that. I've decided to leave those alone when I've created budgets that cut a lot of money because I think a lot of people are dependent on them. I also think we have to figure a way forward. The biggest problem really isn't right now getting an education. We've got plenty of grants, people are getting into school, that's not the problem. The problem you need to think through is not getting a grant and getting into school, it's getting a job when you get out of school and how you're going to pay your loans back. What's happening is the loans are so big and the income's not as large that a lot of people are getting out and making something that's inadequate. I think one of the ways that we could fix and help students is to maybe give tax credits to students as they get out. Not forgive your loans, but let you reduce your taxes, because most people will be working, let you reduce your tax burden some as a way to pay off your student loans. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Great to be here at Berkeley. Thank you. Thank you to the Berkeley Forum for inviting me. Now, you may be a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian. I'm not here to tell you what to be. I am here to tell you, though, that your rights, especially your right to privacy, is under assault. 
I'm here to tell you that if you own a cell phone, you're under surveillance. I'm here to tell you that the NSA believes that equal protection means that Americans should be spied upon equally, including Congress. Instead of equal protection to them, it's equal disdain. They don't care if you're white or black or brown. They care only that everyone must submit to the state. Senator Sanders, and I don't agree on everything, he's an independent from Vermont, but he asked, he asked the NSA, he says, are you collecting records on Congress? And in characteristic arrogance, you know what the NSA said? They said Congress is getting the same treatment everybody else is. In other words, yes, yes, and again, yes, they're spying on Congress. They're collecting our data as well. Digest exactly what that means. If Congress is spied upon without their permission, who exactly is in charge of your government? Last week, we, discern, we, we learned something new. Your senator's in the middle of this. We learned that the CIA is illegally searching the, commuter, the computers of the Senate Intelligence Committee. They're the ones supposed to be overseeing the CIA. I don't know about you, but that worries me. If the CIA is spying on Congress, who exactly can or will stop them? I look into the eyes of senators and I think I see real fear. Maybe it's just my imagination, but I think I perceive fear of an intelligence community that's drunk with power, unrepentant, and uninclined to relinquish power. I'm honestly worried and concerned about who is truly in charge of our government. Now, most of you have read the dystopian nightmares, the dystopian novels, and maybe you're like me, you say, ah, you know, that could never happen in America. And yet, if you have a cell phone, you are under surveillance. Last week, a new revelation came out. The NSA uses an automated system called Turbine. They've hacked into millions of computers. The NSA has even posed as a fake Facebook server. You may have seen Zuckerberg complaining to the president about this, to infect computers. If you have a computer, you may well be under surveillance. Who knows? They won't tell you. Your government collects information from every one of your phone calls. That's what they're maintaining. Remember the warrant that Snowden revealed? Every phone call from Verizon was on the list. Your government stores your email so it can access it without a warrant. Your government claims the right to look at your every purchase online. Your government actually claims that none of your digital records are protected by the Fourth Amendment. Listen very carefully to that. They say they'll protect them, but they say none of your records are protected by the Fourth Amendment. This is something we're going to fight in court. If you own a cell phone, you are under surveillance. I believe what you do on your cell phone is none of their damn business. In the opening pages of Fahrenheit 451, the protagonist Guy Montag asks, wasn't there a time when firemen used to put out fires? They laugh and rebuke him and say, everybody knows that firemen start fires. Montag knows this. His father and grandfather had been firemen. It had been his duty for many years to burn books. He knew it was his duty, but this day would be different. Montag arrives on the scene to do his job, but he finds a woman who won't leave. She stands on her porch as they pile the books about her, but she won't leave. Undeterred, Montag proceeds with the other firemen to douse her and her books with kerosene. The woman shouts out and goads them. She is indignant that they would touch her books. She refuses to leave the port. She says to them, play the man, Master Ridley. Today we will light such a candle by God's grace in England that it won't be soon forgotten. They keep dousing her with kerosene, and she says it again, play the man, Master Ridley. We will light such a candle. In the book, the reference is lost to the firemen as they simply do their job. The reference is to the 16th century figure, Hugh Latimer, who literally became a human candle. He was burned at the stake in 1555 for heresy. His crime, he wanted to promote the idea that the Bible could be translated into English, which the state forbade. 
In the U.S. today, we're not yet burning people at the stake, nor are we burning books yet. But your government is interested in what you're reading. They're interested in what you say on your phone calls. They're interested in what you write in your emails. Or even if they say they're not interested, they say the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect any of these records. The NSA is collecting the records of every American. A year before Snowden's revelations, before Snowden had his leaks, I had heard that this was happening. I had talked with Ron Wyden, I'd seen some of the releases, and I'd heard that they were collecting an unprecedented amount of records. But I wasn't allowed to reveal the number because they say it's a secret. Why the number's a secret, I don't know. So I announced that a gazillion records were being collected because I knew that was a fake number and couldn't get, they can't put me in jail for making up a number. But I wanted to emphasize by using this fictitious number, a gazillion, I wanted the American public to know that the actual number of communications being collected by the federal government was almost beyond comprehension. Senator Wyden of Oregon has been trying to shed some light on this invasion of our privacy. It's an example of how someone from the left and someone from the right come together for something that's good, for the protection of your privacy. He's on the Intelligence Committee, and he's privy to information that very few congressmen or senators have access to. For over a year before Snowden's revelations, Wyden expressed concern that the government was acting outside the law, but he was constrained by the secrecy laws. Finally, a few months before Snowden's leaks, Wyden called the office of the intelligence director, James Clapper, and he says, I'm going to ask you in open committee, are you collecting millions of Americans' records without a warrant? Despite this warn warning, Clapper comes to Congress and lies. This is a felony, punishable up to five years, but you hear nobody talking about it. When this secret surveillance of Americans finally became public, though, no one on the intelligence community was even contrite. Their only regret was that the program was no longer secret. In an almost surreal exchange, a congressman asked the NSA, did you think a program of this magnitude could be kept secret from the American people? The NSA official replied with a slight smile, well, we tried. The sheer arrogance of this, they are only sorry that they got caught. Without the Snowden leaks, these spies would be still be blithely doing whatever they pleased. Some say it's only records, held anonymously, only rarely accessed. What's your beef? Well, what they rarely mention is that they don't believe any of your records have any Fourth Amendment protection. When they say, oh, it's only boring old business records, think of what information is on your visa bill. From your bill, the government can tell whether you drink, whether you smoke, whether you gamble, what books you read, what magazines you read, whether you see a psychiatrist, what medications you take. There was a recent study by two Stanford graduates, were we allowed to mention Stanford here? <laughs> by two Stanford graduates, look it up, in the last week or two it was released showing exactly what can be figured out simply from your boring old phone records. I oppose this abuse of power with every ounce of energy I have. I believe that you have a right to privacy and it should be protected. I believe no government should ever access your records without a judge's warrant. I believe that the majority of Americans agree with me, whether they're Republicans, Democrats, Independents, I think most people are offended by this program. Now, Edward Snowden, the leaker of classified information, did break the law, but so did James Clapper. I don't think there's been enough criticism of Clapper. James Clapper proposed that it was okay to lie to Congress and the American people in the name of security. Snowden proposed that it was okay to leak classified information in the name of liberty. There are laws against both of these, both leaking and lying, yet history sometimes accepts one or both as laudable. If a government official leaks to expose government malfeasance, we sometimes call it whistleblowing. If an enemy asks for secret information, we would expect our intelligence director to lie. But no matter who is testifying to Congress, lying to Congress is still a crime. Lying to Congress also damages credibility. 
When the intelligence director lies, it makes it harder for us to believe him when he comes and tells us,